Thank you so much. Oh, I like that, the new rule. So good evening, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. This is the subcommittee of the Charter and Rules Committee. With me this evening is Councilor Todd McGee, Councilwoman Linda Vacan, and Councilman at Large, and my predecessor as chair, at Large Councilor Joe McGivern. Um, at this time, I will take a motion to take up item number one. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Item number one is the approval of the previous minutes. Ryan sent them out today. I was able to look at them. Any? I was too. They looked okay to me. Yeah, I said you looked down. Did they look okay to they me? They looked okay to me. I make a motion to approve yeah. or accept, however you want to. All righty. All those in favor? Aye. All right. There we go. Look at that. Efficiency. <laughs> is there a motion to take up item number two? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Item number two is an order proposed by Councilor McGee, ordered that the city councilor, city council, I'm tired, city council in order to expand the search for the scope of the city auditor's position, change their residency requirements. Councilor McGee? Yeah, it's um, as we're seeing when we posted for the position last time, and now we're posting it again, um, the reoccurring theme is that uh, we can find candidates out there uh, not necessarily wanting to commit to living in the city of Hoyoke. You know, that, those are pros and cons to that. We want anyone who works in the city to work, uh, live here, but when it comes to the auditor position, um, we're having trouble filling that position and one of the going themes is a residency. So, and, and the other one is to be open is the salary. Um, it's been posted uh, between uh, I think 71 to 78 being the max um, as we learned in, in our discussions regarding all the issues that happened in the auditor's office as well as in other offices that uh, someone graduating with a CPA is getting you know 80 85,000 plus to start and so we're way behind the curve if we're looking for a, a qualified candidate so this is one way to try and hopefully attract more candidates. We did have a public service committee meeting, and we were supposed to have four candidates, which I think only one showed up. So uh, we have to really jump on this and get uh, an auditor position filled, and I hope this is one way to achieve that. Thank you, Councilor Bacon. So the question that had come up on this was whether it was a charter issue or an ordinance charter. issue. Charter. Yeah. It's charter. So, but it's a charter change that we could run through the council? Yep. Okay. Yes, and that's correct. So this was referred to us from the ordinance committee um, because it went through ordinance and then it got sent over to us on April 3rd. Because um, 
if I may. Yep. Ordinance was copied on the order, yep. so we were a little bit out of order in sending it over as a communication, if you would. <laughs> we, were, I think at the time of the meeting, we were unsure if it needed an ordinance or charter right. change, so we split it just to see where it might lie because they're trying to hustle on it. And then we got four candidates, so it kind of dragged. But in the interim, we found out it is a charter change that we can do through the council. Council McGiver, anything? Just um, to uh, concur with some of the things that the president said, I, I first I fully recognize that a lot of our residents, a lot of the voters, are very adamant about residency being part of the uh, the scheme of things when it comes to city employees. But at, at the same time, I, I think they, they recognize that there are certain positions that uh, are not covered by charter, but that there are certain positions that the demand and the qualifications for that positions are extremely important to, to the city. And I think that the uh, relaxing the residency law to get a, a full um, accountant, a full CPA to fill the auditor's position is one of those positions. Um, I, I've often, I, myself, um, I believe, you know, when all things are equal, residency should, uh, should come first. But I believe that we should always be looking for the most qualified person uh, for any position within the city, of, within the city uh, uh, itself. And, and the favorite story I like to tell is, is a good friend of mine um, some 20 years ago was the IT specialist. He lived in Hoyoke for, for the city of Springfield. Uh, Mayor Hurley came along. He'd been there for several years. Mayor Hurley came along and pushed the uh, residency rules of Springfield to a T, where she gave everybody two years to move to the city or get out. And, you know, quite frankly, him and his wife worked in the city of Hoyoke, and their children were going to Hoyoke Public Schools and did not want to move to Springfield. And at the point of two years, he resigned his position and you know, sought employment elsewhere. Um, th this person had written all the software, all the programs from payroll to everything the city was using and was extremely valuable in his position. A new person was hired to do his job. Within six months, he was hired back as a consultant. He absolutely loved it because he says, I'm doing my same job for more money and I have no headaches. <laughs> But that's the key of importance of a position to to the 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 business aspect of a city. We I think we all believe in residency. I hope people want to live in Hoyoke because they want to live in Hoyoke, not because they're forced. But when it comes to the uh, the qualifications, we have to get what's best for the city. And I think we can relax. You know, let, let, let's face it. Not filling the position of auditor over the last uh, two to three years cost us a hundred thousand dollars. You know, and that's that's on the city council. You know, we, we, we didn't have an auditor in place, you know, when all that fiasco went through uh, last year and when everything, loose ends weren't tied and when we did put an auditor in there, you know, it didn't, the job just wasn't done. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, we need to get an auditor in that position very quickly. Thank you. My opinion on the matters is I'm going to support this this evening as well. Just a cautionary tale as someone who is in favor of heavy residency requirements. I already saw we had one for the HR department head, and then I think in a year or two we might see one for another department head. And So just a cautionary tale to the wind. I'm going to support this this evening because I agree with my colleagues. I know that this body, and I was very grateful to be a part of that, and I actually think, um, you know, Councilor Vacan, who was a big pusher of that, we strengthen our residency requirements for department heads. So my only cautionary tale to the wind is that I hope this doesn't open up Pandora's box because then I could hear them saying, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, so I'm, it's just a cautionary tale. I will support this in the spirit of what it is. Um, I will not support others. Um, but it's only in the sense that exactly, we want to find someone who's good and qualified, but I'm really just cautiously cautious, I guess. I don't know if that's even a word, but I just invented it this evening like the new five minute rule. Um, but that's my only concern with us approving this is you know, what else is going to come through next? And then I can hear our colleagues, I can hear, you know, the administration saying, well, you did it for the auditor, so now we need to amend it for this department head or that department head because we can't find any qualified candidates. So that's all I have to say. Um, Councilor Bacon. Thank you. Um, I share uh, many of your perspectives on this. 
But I do think if you keep doing the same thing over and over and getting the same result, <laughs> it's time to reconsider the strategy. And, it, and I do think we have to be able to see when an exception is required. Um, but like you, I would say very specifically, it's a unique circumstance. We have had concrete and visible challenges relative to this position. So we need to take steps to improve our options. So um, I will actually make the motion that we um, take steps to make the necessary charter change to um, change the residency requirement for only the city auditor position. Second. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, with that, we will recommend to the council to approve that charter change only for the city auditor. Alrighty. Sounds perfect. All right, with that, I'll entertain a motion for the next item. Motion move item number three. And continue the public hearing. And continue the public hearing. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Alrighty, a motion number three is a continued public hearing from Council Roman order that the City Council review and hold a public hearing on rules of the City Council and make any recommendations for changes and to the rules document. Um, I was actually going to come before you all today to say unless there was anything specific or any proposed changes, um, I read through the document again and hearing the technical difficulties in speaking with the um, clerk's office, um, it was just around the order have one of these? Do you need one? Uh, just around the order of the meeting. It's but the December 11th? December 11th, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Make sure um, you're on the right. <laughs> just under Rule 26, just that was a little bit out of whack from what we actually have, but I get it. It's a software issue. It's not an us issue. Um, so I think I'm fine with that, and I would just actually ask that if my colleagues, unless Councilor McGivern has anything, can we just consider this complied with? I think it's a pretty solid, straightforward thing, but I don't think that there was anything specifically that jumped out at me. Um, and probably at next charter meeting too I'll take up and I've been observing our committee meetings and I know the recommendation about allowing public hearings we had a very heated debate in a good way a healthy debate I think that one's going to be compliant with too I all committee chairs have been very open and welcoming to any member of the public who wants to speak and that's a separate order we'll take up at a later time but uh, unless anyone here has any specific changes I, I agree with the uh, with the intent and I thank the you know the chairman for putting this forward and it's, it's obvious that the, uh, the public is uh, not interested or, or believes our rules do work. Um, the only one I would, I would suggest that someday somebody will explain to me is rule number nine, but other than that, I think I understand or understand the intent of all our rules. Don't look at it now because you don't want to, you don't want to read it. <laughs> oh, I looked at that one too. Yeah, that's, that's a tongue twister. All right. It's so, a fill in the blank. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you usually get to do that. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Might take that one up, Joe. Yeah. On yeah. I am, I'm warm to considering this complied with, but I just would make the comment mm -hmm. that we have a lot of rules. There's a number of them that are not followed. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing oh, I would generally question is, if we're routinely not following them, do we need them, why do we have them? And I'm not feeling so strongly about this mm -hmm. that I would keep this item open to pursue it, but the late filed order thing mm. is continuing to be problematic. And if I had been going to recommend something, I would have suggested that maybe those have to run through the president before they're filed to be found to be of an emergency nature because it's once again being used in my opinion to circumvent the open meeting law and the 48 hour notice and I don't like it because there's big things that come in late like the budget like transfers from the stabilization fund you know things like that that are definitely of the public interest so um, that's, you know, a bone I'll chew on, but I'm still willing to consider it complied with if uh, the committee's will is such. I'll address that. I mean, late files, uh, if you look to Rule 44, at the bottom it says added November 15, 2016. 
Late file order shall be limited to 10. If a late file order is deemed an emergency, the president, uh, city council president may replace any order on the late file docket that is not emergency in nature. Um, so when we had this discussion and change this rule is anything over 10, the president would take them in order and determine what is an emergency from one to 10. And if it was 11, 12, 13, 14, they were forced to the next meeting. We haven't had any items exceed 10 except for one meeting. And those, that, that was the night we said that we're not gonna do this anymore. We're not gonna have late files come in without our notice. Uh, last meeting, there were only four. Um, so that would, would have been in the 10. Now, the real issue should be is, as Councillor, I think it was late, he said way back when is, the late file order should have some type of note with it explaining why it is a late file order. That would be a procedure. And then we, I think as a body, would determine if that truly is late file. Um, I'm not sure if we want one person holding the hammer saying, well, I don't view it as late file mm -hmm. and someone else does. I mean, I mean that, that's where we go back and forth. But the last few meetings have been in compliance with this back part, which is 10 or less, and if so, you, you take them up. Mm -hmm. I happen to agree, and I'll go to you in a second, Councilor Bacon. I think what Councilor Bacon's saying is what I agree with, too, is within those 10, if they fall under that 10, there's still items that are like immediate, you know, transfer, or here's this report here, or here's that there. So I, I do happen to agree. So maybe what we could do is for this specific purpose, because it's the entire document, I will probably at the next meeting, and if you would like to co-file, we could specifically call in Rule 44 to tighten up specifically that to say, I agree with you, Councilor Vacon, any late file should have that notice on top. And I think that that should come before us to vote if it's late file or not. But I agree, it's to circumvent the open meeting law. So, Councilor I, Vacon. I'm fully so, with Councilor Vacon. So, I just would note that within our rules, um, we do state that an order request resolution or other form of business should only be presented to the city council other than provided for above if in the opinion of the maker of the order request resolution or other form of business the matter requires the urgent and immediate attention of the council so that to me agrees with the addition that we made um, about non-emergency they should all be an emergency I mean, that's the whole reason why it's there. So I think it's just, like you say, a compliance issue, and maybe we're coming to it naturally. Yeah. So I won't labor it. Yeah. All right. Anything, Councilor? Anything else, Council McGivern? All set? Okay. All right. So I'll entertain a motion to, that the order be complied with. Motion has been complied with. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All those opposed? Hearing none. And then. I'll take up a motion to take up the last item on the agenda. Uh, so moved. Item number four. Number four. So move, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item number four, ordered by Councilor Lisi, ordered that the City Council add a permanent agenda item, reports of ad hoc committees. That would fall under here. That would fall under rule. So 26. 26 would be the yes. business shall be as follow and you have to put it somewhere within there. So. Speaking as someone who had uh, a subcommittee added and it took a year and a half, it's a it's a daunting process with the, the system that prints out all of our agendas. The, the, the problem is, and, I, and I, I've said this before, is we should sit with the clerk mm -hmm. and have her show us the system the way it is set up we, we believe it's like almost like a word system but it's not no. and in order to add in something they have to call an IT and say you have to change the program, the program. Mm -hmm. and it's it's very yeah. it's hard conservation um, I would say the number nine under rule 26 really accommodates any committee that would need to report anything okay and I suppose if we wanted to make sure it included ad hoc committees, what ad hoc committees do we have at this point? I think when we were doing the rules last time, uh, Councillor uh, Roman and I wanted to look into doing a business 
ad hoc business committee. Separate from what, you know, Hedick and everyone else does, we were just trying to be proactive and, you know, if there was, I think at the time, what was it, um, Amazon was looking yep. to move somewhere. We as a committee would send out and say, come, come look at Hoyle. Okay. Or if we hear about a business in Connecticut who's fishing around, we send off a letter, kind of like um, the youth in Springfield, what was the, the young professionals in Springfield? Yep. They set up a committee, that's how they started. Yep. It started actually so they would have legal yes. a, a standing as representing the council. It was yes. representing the council, but they'd, you know, they'd, rep, they'd tell the council, hey, we're looking to send a letter to such and such. But just be really proactive. Here's a suggestion yes. for a simple answer. Under nine, put in parentheses, standing and ad hoc. There you go. No, How's no. that? I like that. Would that be, would that fit with the clerk, you think? I think we could I check. Think, I think. Does she have enough spaces? I think. And if I may. Or just, I I think. Think. just put, um, like including ad hoc, whatever would fit. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think too, just to, I, I know Councilor Lisi's not here, but in the spirit of it, it's like, for example, I know that, you know, we were just discussing, I believe it was last night or the night before. Council McGivern is saying that the you know mayor's office is going to form a new ad hoc committee around I oh, forget the parking. the parking and and similar to the school bus or similar to like building and so like there's a lot of these ad hocs that are requesting city council members serve on them but we were kind of discussing how does that get back to us or exactly if the president forms a new ad hoc committee how does that get back to the rest of the body I agree with Councilor Bacon I think that to me satisfies it. I think that that's a simple, easy solution. Okay, so how about if I make it as a motion to include ad hoc committees under Rule 26, Item 9, in a way that is clear and works with the clerk's system of notice. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I like it. Second. Council McGivern, further discussion? I I'm, don't want to speak for the maker of the order, but I agree with the ad hoc part, but I also think it covers another base. And if you look at the end of uh, Rule 32, uh, after all the committees, after all the standing committees, mm -hmm. it talks about when a city councilor serves on another municipal board. And we, you know, we sometimes get away from this, and it's important to remember that the city council that sits on any municipal board is al you know, allowed to on their own prerogative. Um, you know, Hedick, I'm appointed by the mayor and I'm actually representing all of government. I think you're always a city councilor. But no city councilor represents the city council unless the city council confirms it or the city council president, you know, allows a city councilor to sit like on the school building committee. Um, I'm gonna be asking the president if he would allow me or the council would allow me to sit on a newly formed parking committee by the mayor to try to resolve our downtown parking issues. And uh, if anybody wants to volunteer, I'll be glad to step out of that one. <laughs> but I think, you know, Rule 32 is is kind of what Councilor Lisi is, is saying is that, you know, even though these aren't standing committees, you know, if we're representing the uh, John Bernal for years, Todd, I think you did it more recently, represented this council with the building committee for the schools is very important when there's con new construction being proposed and in the hopper. And we should have an avenue to get, you know, periodic reports from the individual. I think that was key, Joe, because when I sat on that school, moving the school department building, um, they wanted to make a recommendation and wanted me to sign off. And I said, that's not what I can do. I can file an order and bring you guys back in and present all the options. Whatever you guys want, you recommend, but it's up to you to show the council everything. And that way, it went right to your point is, I wasn't the authority to say, yeah, I support that, that's what the council do. I was very clear, I'm here to get the information, add feedback, but then it all has to come back to the council to be presented. Yeah, and that, that was the key. That, that's very important too because, and I understand where they're coming from because years ago I learned the school committee designates some of their their subcommittees with final authority. It doesn't go back to the school committee. To me, that's not the right way to do business, but that's their business. Your bylaws must be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. So we have a motion made to. Amend Rule 26, Section 9 uh, to under reports and committees to say standing and ad hoc or whatever is the simplest way that will uh, complement with the software programming in the clerk's office. 
So seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, there's just one other motion before us. Motion to adjourn. Oh, I love that motion. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> uh, Efficiency. I like that. There we go. Look, boom, boom, boom. Meeting is adjourned. Ryan, if you're still downstairs, can you stop up at your office before you leave? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>